95% of the water used in Northwest Indiana is sourced from Lake Michigan. 59% of that water is used for industrial purposes. 37% of that water is used in energy production. And only 4% of that water is consumed by the public. Simply put, water not only keeps us alive, but it keeps Northwest Indiana's economic engine humming as well. So the topic of today's forum, the thirst for clean water, embraces the breadth of this conversation. People thirst, the environment thirsts, industry thirsts, the economy thirsts. As Nobel Prize recipient Albert saint gergi uh, famously said, Water is life's mate, mater and matrix, mother and medium. There is no life without water. And it's true that there's a veritable matrix of ways to look at the clean water conundrum. So many parts of contaminated water versus parts clean. So many parts accessible to those who can pay versus so many parts for those without sufficient funds. So many parts wasted through careless use at home or in industry versus so many parts treasured drop by drop. So many parts for those with a political voice and so many parts for those with no voice. We can slice this water discussion a lot of ways and we must slice it in so many ways because of the impact of clean water or the lack of it affects every person in every sector. It is as complex as the physiological, political, economic, biochemical, and moral and ethical dynamics of the ecosystem that we live in. And it's a discussion both urgent and critical. Even a few weeks ago, the United Nations celebrated World Water Day to bring attention to the issue of clean water worldwide. In fact, the UN has declared access to safe and clean water as a basic human right. The subject is bigger than any one entity is going to be able to solve because economy, ecology, science, and social justice are expansive, interdependent, and interwoven. So I find it heartening that this forum brings together experts from so many diverse fields and tackles this subject from so many diverse perspectives. This forum exemplifies the mission of Valparaiso University to pursue truth wherever it leads to grapple with complex issues, with a belief that together we will be able to illuminate solutions that will serve people well. And so I want to express my thanks first to Professor Julie Peller uh, and to all those who have been involved in organizing this event. Uh, we're also so fortunate, I, I met him a few minutes ago, I'm trying to figure out where he is here, Professor Mark Edwards, here, straight in the back here. Uh, we're so pleased. Uh, the Professor Mark Edwards is joining us today as our keynote speaker, and as you know, uh, Professor uh, Edwards is a trailblazer in this intersection of water and social justice. And among his many accolades, he received an IEEE Barris Award for courageously defending the public interest at great personal risk. Professor Edwards, um, you really live out the model of this university and what you do. Um, we are proud and privileged to have you here with us. And I am grateful for the courage uh, that you exemplify in, in the interests of uh, social justice and in the pursuit of truth. So thank you for being with us today. I also want to thank the uh, Abrams Environmental Law Clinic at the University of Chicago uh, and to Robert Weinstock uh, for your participation, uh, which I hope will lay the foundation for future collaboration between our institutions. Uh, and in particular, I want to show my uh, personal appreciation uh, to Walt Breidinger. So Walt, um, we want to thank you because you are uh, the person that has really uh, carried the water on this one uh, for quite a while. You have a vision uh, for bringing this community together around this topic and I hope you'll just take a moment and join me in thanking Walt for his leadership. So thank you. We're also fortunate to have guests here today from the University of Notre Dame, uh, from Virginia Tech, from Purdue University, as well as, of course, our faculty, staff, and students here at Valpo. Uh, I also want to welcome our uh, colleagues in the non-for-profit community here, Save the Dunes, Hoosier Environmental Council, uh, the local chapter of the Isaac Walton League, the Ogden Dunes Environmental Advisory Council, and Faith CDC. Uh, we are blessed by your work in this community and region and your unique perspectives. And I also want to take a minute and point out that all of the folks that are listed here on these slides 
Uh, these are our financial sponsors that made today possible, and I'd like to take a moment and have us all recognize them and thank them for their financial support. So thank you. And of course, there are members of this community, uh, this larger Northwest Indiana region, uh, who want to come together for a, an important day of dialogue and, to, and for you. Uh, I am also grateful that you take this uh, half a day and spend time together uh, on this very important topic. Each of you, speakers, panelists, uh, excel in your own fields and break new ground. Uh, together, I believe that the possibilities for raising awareness in this region uh, and in a seeding social change uh, are uh, limitless when we come together. So may these ideas today flow freely and refreshingly as that cool glass of water that we take for granted, poured from our tap. Uh, and may this forum provide a vital space for learning, for dialogue, and a launching pad for collaborative efforts moving forward. Thank you for being here today, and uh, blessings on your gathering. Thank you. Okay, this podium's a little small for me, so I'm just going to go ahead and probably get it out of the way um, and uh, start off our first panel discussion for the day. Okay. Uh, so, uh, hello and welcome to everyone uh, and all of our panelists. Thank you for coming to today's symposium on clean water, uh, especially as it applies to our communities here in Northwest Indiana and around the Great Lakes region. Uh, I'd like to thank President Heckler and Valparaiso University for uh, making this possible, and as well our, our numerous sponsors and, and donors, without whom we would not be able to uh, have such a wonderful event. Uh, I was just asked also, uh, because we will be having some folks coming in uh, throughout the sessions today, if we could try and kind of scooch in so that as they come in they can not be disturbing anybody and, and make it into the sides if that's possible. Um, so I'm going to be your first moderator for today. My name is Chris Eisman. Uh, I'm from the chemistry department here at Valparaiso University. Um, and today our first session will be a panel that addresses in particular surface waters uh, and legislation monitoring or lack thereof of those surface waters uh, and protecting um, those waters for all of us. Uh, our panelists are of great esteem, uh, and I'm honored to introduce them to you now. So I'm going to give you an introduction to them all at the beginning. That way, I can kind of disappear into the background and, and let them go. Uh, so our first panelist is Rob Weinstock uh, from the Abrams Environmental Clinic at the University of Chicago. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Rob over the phone uh, this week, uh, and I'm happy that he's joining us today to talk about our Clean Water Act. Uh, I'm very impressed by Rob's bio, which you can all read uh, on the website uh, in his vitae that displays uh, his dedication to mentees at the Abrams Environmental Law Clinic, uh, helping them on the path uh, to understanding litigation which concerns uh, our environment and each other. Uh, our second panelist is Aaron Korn, uh, who I've come to know over the past few months uh, as he's recently taken on his new role at the Hoosier Environmental Council. Uh, Aaron has a real passion for the peoples in Northwest Indiana, uh, which is demonstrated in his diligent work uh, in our communities, especially with regards to farming infrastructure uh, and its effects on our environment and waters, which he will discuss today. Uh, our third panelist is Julie Peller, um, professor of chemistry here at Valparaiso University. Uh, and I could go on about Julie and her accolades, being that I have an office right across from hers. Uh, but suffice to say, Julie really cares uh, about using her science to help people in her community. Um, Julie's continued to receive national funding uh, to investigate the waters in and around Lake Michigan. Uh, and we'll talk today about scientific monitoring of these waterways and their shortfalls. And our final panelist will be Dr. Graham Peasley, a professor of physics at Notre Dame, who I've had the pleasure of working with for about a year or so now. Uh, Graham is a wonderful and inspiring individual who has an extensive career demonstrating how he cares through for communities through his science, uh, which spans toxic metals uh, and organic pollutants in places like our natural waterways as well as fast food wrappers. 
Um, Graham will speak to us today about his recent work investigating uh, polyfluorinated compounds uh, in water systems. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to have our first speaker, Rob Weinstock, begin. Uh, I'd like to remind you all that we have index cards placed around the room and little pencils. If you'd like to write down a question during the panel, uh, I'm going to kind of be circulating around the periphery uh, and picking those up. So if you could kind of slide them out to the edge if you have a question. I'll collect them, try to topically organize them, and then we can ask those questions. Uh, I'll relay them to the panelists at the end. Uh, let's show respect to our panelists uh, by giving them some good questions. Uh, and hopefully uh, we can show them how much we appreciate their time at the end. I think we'll have 12 or 15 minutes or so. So I'll put my big mid up when you're down to about three and you can know where you're at. Uh, and uh, without further ado, let's let's let Rob talk. Yeah. How's that? Great, maybe I'll just hold on to it. Um, so in, in 12 to 15 minutes, I'm going to try to introduce everyone to the Federal Clean Water Act. Um, and really what I'm focused on uh, is some of the shortcomings and, and loopholes in that act that caused problems in its implementation today, uh, over 45 years after it was enacted. So as Chris mentioned, um, I work at the Abrams Environmental Law Clinic at the University of Chicago Law School. Um, where, is there a clicker for the slide? Um, where we work on a wide range of energy and environmental litigation and policy projects, including a significant docket of Clean Water Act litigation uh, and other water policy projects. Um, so today, my, my objective is to, again, introduce you to the Clean Water Act, uh, specifically thinking about the fundamental prohibition on water pollution that is at its core. Thanks, Chris. Um, and uh, the way it's implemented through the permitting process and enforcement, and again, pointing out some loopholes, and I'm going to wind up with uh,
So, you've got your core prohibition in the Clean Water Act. Thou shalt not pollute. There's some exceptions that we see in the definition. There's a bigger exception than that. You're allowed to discharge if you have the permit that's properly issued. Under the Clean Water Act, remember, it's a federal statute administered by the U.S. EPA, but the U.S. EPA is allowed to delegate that authority to the states, and states can issue permits and have their own permitting program to allow people to discharge pollutants under conditions. In Indiana, that's done by the Indiana Department of Management or ITEM, uh, and uh, and this graphic I thought was kind of funny. It's actually from ITEM's website, so you can kind of get a sense of their approach to permitting. Um, so what are these state agencies supposed to be doing when they write a permit? Well, there's things called technology-based limitations, and water quality-based limitations, or effluent limitations. Those are the actual parts of the permit that tell the company or the, or the discharger how much of what they're allowed to discharge. Operational requirements and monitoring and reporting requirements are other parts of the permit that tell the, that tell the discharger how they have to run their wastewater operations, minimum, certain sort of minimum standards of care, uh, and monitoring and reporting. Uh, in all of these permits, the discharger themselves are required to monitor what they're actually putting into the water body, report that to the state agency, and that information um, becomes public. Uh, this is really complicated. The image is drawn from uh, a U.S. EPA uh, guidance document that is hundreds of pages long. Um, but I do want to point out just two quick things about the technology-based limitations, water quality-based limitations. Uh, the permit, you're only allowed to discharge the lower number based on what you can do based on technology or what the water body can bear based on water quality. Technology-based limitations are focused on the industry. So when you're in an industry category, what are the standards that the EPA expects you to meet? Those are the technology-based limitations. Those are issued generally by the federal government, and the states apply them. And, uh, and the water quality-based limitations are based on local science about the actual water body. And you'll hear a bit from Julie, uh, Professor Keller, excuse me, in a few minutes, um, about uh, how it, uh, some of the shortcomings sometimes in that monitoring, uh, in that water quality monitoring state level. Um, but I want to hit upon a couple shortcomings uh, in the permit process itself. So on that water quality, again, we hear from Julie. When you talk about the technology-based limitations, again, it's industry-specific. The federal government issues those uh, those limitations periodically, uh, but it is incredibly outdated. So for the steel industry, it's 2005 guidance still governs today. And you may think, well, it's only 15 years ago, 2005, not too bad. Uh, and you'd be right. That's one of the most recent uh, industry guidelines. For the metal finishing industry, it's a pretty closely related industry. It's a 1986 guidance document. And for many of the, uh, for many industry sectors, the guidance documents have not been revised since they were first published in the mid-1970s. So you've got extremely outdated standards when you're talking about technology-based uh, limitations in permits. Another limit in this process is the reliance on the applicant. Uh, all the information that goes, that generates a permit generally is provided by the applicant themselves. This makes sense. Agencies don't have the resources to sort of ground truth every fact. They don't have the resources necessarily to be out in the field all the time. Um, but that means the applicant can shape what goes into the, what goes into the permit. There's also uh, availability of all sorts of what are called regulatory relief mechanisms to give extensions or flexibility in the way people comply with their permit. And then the monitoring requirements that are written into the permit that are often uh, very weak and manipulated um, by allowing the use of averaging um, or having it be vague to allow uh, the discharger, who again has to self-monitor, uh, to sort of manipulate that process. And it's the self-monitoring and the manipulation of the, the averaging and, uh, and the monitoring requirements is really important because uh, that self-monitoring forms the core of uh, enforcement actions under the law. Um, when those, when, they, when a discharger reports a violation, uh, they have violated like their permit, they have violated the law, and a number of different uh, enforcement actions could follow. So theoretically, the Clean Water Act actually is extremely robust uh, enforcement mechanism. It allows for $55,000 per day per violation penalty. So if you are violating, that can add up pretty quickly to a statutory maximum penalty. It also doesn't ask what, whether you are at fault or not. 
If you have a permit, you're discharging with special permission, and if you violate it, you are liable. There's no question about fault or your intention. Um, and so that actually makes it quite a, potentially very powerful too. It allows for enforcement by federal agencies or the state agencies. It allows for enforcement in court uh, or through an administrative, administrative process, basically an administrative citation and the process uh, within the agency. And like some of the other environmental statutes that were passed in the 70s, it has what's called a citizen suit provision. That allows any member of the public who, is in, who uses or relies on the water body impacted by the violation to bring a suit themselves. Um, and, and they can allege violations of the act and seek penalties and seek uh, to force the discharge or to take specific steps to correct the violation. With regard to keeping shortcomings and some problems with the enforcement regime as well, that self-monitoring I've talked about quite a bit. One example of this, if you have uh, a monitoring provision that says you have to take a sample twice a week in your industrial facility, you might sample on Saturday and Sunday when the assembly line's not running. If you have a permit condition that says you need to take an average, you need to maintain an average discharge level of a certain pollutant over a month, you may sample on the first of the month, you get a really high number, and then say, oh, we got to bring that number down, let's change what we're doing, and then sample every day of the month so we can bring that number down to your average, right? Um, or if you get a good number, you may say, oh, we got a good number on day one, that's the average number for the whole month, we won't sample it. And that's perfectly permissible in many permits. Um, Cooperative federalism is the idea that the state and federal government has to work together. That's a really hotly debated legal term and topic. Uh, but what I want you to know here is that the current uh, US EPA interprets that idea to mean they will not bring enforcement action unless the state agency asks them to do so. Which is very different than it has been interpreted and applied to previous administrations of both parties. And what that means is that state governments that may have close relationships with industrial dischargers for a variety of reasons, uh, they get to be the ones Limitations of citizen suits are important. Um, while people have the right to sue, they don't always have the resources or expertise or tools at their disposal to do that. There are a whole variety of reasons. A couple that apply across the board. Individual people don't have the subpoena power. Individual people can't show up to an industrial facility and demand the right to inspect the facility. Government agencies can do that. Additionally, these can be very complicated cases. They can require a lot of expertise, they're legal and technical, so it's very difficult. The left here is one of our clients from Surf Rider Chicago. Uh, I think that picture is actually taken from Whiting, um, and the picture on the right is sort of a dramatic recreation of those. So, as I said, they surf uh, on the south end of Lake Michigan. Uh, I don't know, have anyone ever seen them out there surfing? Yeah, oh, yeah. And um, one thing that's crazy is the best ways are to reach So, we're often out there when it's like 35 degrees. Um, started looking into um, what was in the water in the South Bend. And being lawyers, we look at legal terms, and the first thing we did was we looked at the South Bend. These are just some of the major funding facilities uh, near the two, the two beaches that we flagged before. Not all of them, uh, certainly. Uh, and we asked, okay, they've got permits. Let's assume for the moment that their permits are strong enough, because looking into the adequacy of that is a really tough scientific question, so let's take that off the table as lawyers, again, we're not that smart. Um, and let's see, are they complying with their permits? Well, this chart, this, this graphic is not meant to be a read, it's meant to impress you with the amount of words on the screen. These are, these are industrial facilities, again, a subset of those we saw in the past, that had violations uh, in multiple months during the preceding three years. Um, and what you'll notice, I think, that's really important is down here you've got two publishers on the water treatment plants, Jerry and Henry. Up there is the industrial facilities along the lake. Uh, if you look here, these publicly owned 
approval alerts have been subject to federal enforcement actions in court, while the industrial discharges are top state administrative citations. Orders of magnitude lower penalties. Um, again, when you're comparing publicly owned wastewater treatment plants uh, that get their money from great payers uh, versus these industrial facilities further up. Um, so we were doing this in the spring of 2017 when uh, April 11th, 2017 happened. I'm sure people in this room remember uh, what happened on that day. It was disclosed that U.S. Steel had dumped about over 300 pounds of hexavalent chromium into the Burns Canal, which is about a couple hundred feet from Lake Michigan. Um, that caused the closure of public beaches in what is now the Indiana Dunes National Park, um, and also the closure of public drinking water intakes to, uh, to the Indiana American water, threatened the drinking water intake in Chicago uh, up there. Um, since then, we've been in, in basically constant litigation. We started looking into the facility, researching it. We found out that this one spill was not an isolated incident. It arose from a pattern of field maintenance with underinvestment in the facility, um, and was just the latest of a string of Clean Water Act violations in terms of the chromium releases, hexavalent chromium releases. We uh, started the litigation process in November, of 2017, finally we were able to sue in federal court in January. In April of 2018, um, the government announced that it, it thought it was a good idea to bring a lawsuit to it. Uh, and on the same day it filed their complaint, April 4th, 2018, so almost exactly a year ago, uh, it filed a proposed settlement of that complaint. Um, and that's really where the attention shifted at that point, was to looking at their proposed settlement and assessing from a technical perspective, would it actually prevent future violations? And from a sort of justice perspective, a penalty perspective, does it actually provide a stiff enough financial penalty such that U.S. Steel will change its behavior and other industrial discharges will understand the serious, seriousness of the violation? Uh, what may, may or may not be a surprise, we feel like that consent decree, the proposed consent decree, is too weak. So uh, we, along with about 2,700 others, submitted public comment and informally intervened in the litigation. Even while the litigation was ongoing, U.S. Steel has violated its permit again in November and December. I think some people in the room may have even seen uh, during November and December there were sort of suspicious family discharges coming from the facility that violated its permit. And meanwhile, there is still hexavalent chromium in the groundwater beneath the facility from that April spill. And item doesn't really know if any of that or how much of that is reaching Burns Canal. We don't know the groundwater moves in that direction. So there are still a number of unanswered questions about the impact of that even setting aside um, the, the proposed consent decree. And there are still problems with the way the facility is being managed, even though they are now supposed to have reform. So I, I will leave it uh, at that, I think, and I look forward to hearing your panelists today uh, and to any questions. Uh, thank you all for being here. So uh, my name is Derek Horn. I work at the Huge Environmental Council as a, uh, an attorney, um, and I'm centered in Northwest Indiana. Um, one of the things that we focus on a lot in the Huge Environmental Council is working on uh, factory farms, uh, or, or what we call CAFOs. Um, so I uh, kind of want to talk about a few things. One is what is a CAFO or, or CFO, uh, the environmental and public health impact of um, of factory farming, um, the, or threat to streams, groundwater, uh, and other water sources, and then the quality of life concerns for people who live around those um, those, those farms, um, and then uh, gaps in current laws, and then uh, kind of common sense legislative solutions that we were, were kind of offering and hope that uh, we can get support around and that, that you uh, might join us on. Um, so this is uh, kind of like a demonstration of what a CAFO looks like um, uh, in terms of, of how large of operations we, we are talking about. So a lot of the things that um, we are 
you, 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 when you think of a farm, like most people think of a farm, they're thinking of uh, a nice big red barn um, and and some animals out to pasture. But that that's really shifted in the last uh, few years, especially in Indiana. Uh, we seen a huge um, kind of turn to, to, to large industrial operations and not traditional farming. So, uh, so what is a CAFO and what is a CFO? So these are these are terms of, uh, of legal art. Uh, a confined feeding operation in Indiana is defined as a 300 plus cattle, um, um, and you can see the numbers there. Whereas a concentrated animal feeding operation, a CAFO, uh, has federal law implications as well. Um, but also is in, in uh, kind of Indiana terminology uh, uh, by item because they require um, uh, kind of more regulation. Uh, they have, um, you can see that the, the scale is, is just different. So we're talking from from 300 to, to, to 1,000 cattle, um, uh, 2,000 plus swine. Um, and then you're, you're talking about when, we're, when we see things like broilers or, or hens, those are just different kinds of chickens. Um, and so uh, we're talking huge, huge numbers of animals in, in, a, in a small location. That's what these operations look like on the inside often. Um, so we're really keeping them very, very confined. Now, the, the impact to groundwater that we have to worry about is uh, where, where the weight of these animals is going. Where is their manure uh, uh, going? And um, so often it's in these earthen manure lagoons, um, and they're unlined. They're not required to be lined with any material, and so you can see that, um, especially in places like northwest Indiana, where the soil is hydric soil, which means inundated uh, by, by water a lot of the year, or it's sandy, uh, that these unlined earthen lagoons can reach into the water. Uh, they're also m in manure slurry tanks. Uh, and then one of the things that they do, uh, especially for hogs and for other things as well, is they just let the waste drift down uh, the, you know, the, the hog, you know, uh, waste where they will, and then that, that falls down into a manure pit. Uh, and then after they collect that manure eventually, after, uh, they spread it untreated on surrounding land. So uh, it, there's a lot of uh, you know, implications, uh, and that, th this is, shows you the map of, of CAFOs and CFOs in Indiana. Um, you can see that uh, there's been a growth in CAFOs, even though there's been a diminishment in CFOs. But what we're really seeing is actually that it isn't that there's less people doing, uh, raising animals, it's that they're concentrating them into a few industrial facilities. Um, and you can see that they're kind of located across the in, uh, but in a few big clusters. So here's the, the, the kind of rub of all of that, is that the waste from animals, which is untreated, gets into our water supply almost at every single step of that process that I just showed you. Uh, it, it can leach into waters uh, from the unlined earth. It can leach into waters um, from leaks in the, in the storage. And it can leach into water when you when you put it uh, on your crop and surrounding land uh, untreated. Um, and and how we know this is that uh, there's a huge amount of E. coli in water all across the state. Uh, and that that like some of that could be accounted for by people, but the vast majority of it is accounted for by animal by uh, animal animal waste. Uh, so if you look at dry waste millions of times, I know that you didn't come here to look at pictures of poop on slides, but this is uh, the, the, the animal production in the United States per, per, uh, accounts for um, many more millions of tons of waste than, than human waste production. Uh, the pollution strength, I'll just leave you to read that, is, is, is many times stronger than uh, human waste, and we require human waste to be treated whereas we don't require animal waste to be treated. Um, when you go through human waste, that's all everything they have to go through, whereas in livestock waste, we're just throwing it on land uh, uh, and in, in ponds. Um, and so, like I said, at every single step, uh, the, wa the we're, we're providing risks that those, that waste, the untreated waste, 
will end up in our water supply. Um, what we're seeing now is that, uh, that we're seeing a lot of uh, uh, capital uh, applications in areas that have hydric soil, but in areas that have uh, sand and runoff, in areas that are in watersheds, and in areas that are around population areas where as they weren't, they, they generally wouldn't do that uh, previously. Um, so quality of life concerns. Um, you, you can, I just want to, so this is, this is one of the, the ditches that was next to uh, um, some neighbors where they, they, they noticed this happened as soon as the capital opened up next, next to their, next to their homes. Um, quality of life concerns, uh, obviously, like non-water related quality of life concerns is that if you have a CAFO, if that large industrial facility opens up next to your house, your house isn't worth anything the next day. Like, you can't breathe, uh, creates a number of health issues, um, none of which are regulated uh, by Indiana law. So, um, Indiana's current CFO rule is that um, you must attain item approval. We put approval in quotes because item, you, as you, you they, they're kind of an approval stamping agency. Uh, you have to get item approval before constructing a new CFO or CAFO uh, or increasing the number of animals in existing uh, CFO or CAFO um, or increasing the manure storage capacity. Um, you 